Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Restored to More. Today we are going to be interviewing Mark Castleman. Mark is a board certified pastoral counselor and spiritual mental health practitioner with a specialty in addiction recovery and behavior change. For the last 19 years, Mark is focused on providing hope and a path of healing for men battling with pornography and sexual addiction and women who bear the heavy burden of betrayal trauma, couples also who are striving to save their marriage. His bestseller is The Drug of the New Millennium, which focuses on brain science behind the internet pornography use and his newest book, The Pornography Paradox, which sheds light on how good Christian men can become trapped in pornography and sexual addiction and still be set free. Mark, we're so glad to have you on the show. Thank you for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Man, such a time as this. I'm like, when he's talking about your books, I'm like, okay, how much are we just like saturated in a society right now where this is like very evident and more pastors are being found out and good people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. And the thing about it is it's, it's really, it, in the old days, it used to be, you know, certain people would, you know, slink down to the adult bookstore and hope their neighbors didn't see them. And yeah. it was just kind of this taboo, dark in the shadows kind of thing. But with technology, and especially with, with COVID, because everyone has now kind of gone online, the numbers are just skyrocketing, right? I, I thought they were high before. And now you look at a lot of the, uh, for example, the providers of pornography are sort of bragging about the fact that their numbers have just, you know, are off the charts. So it's, it's everywhere. I have, I have clients all over the world it, uh, from all religious backgrounds. It just, it doesn't know any boundaries, not to age, gender, belief system, upbringing. It doesn't matter. Everybody is susceptible. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know? Yeah. And I, I've, I've been in conversations where some therapists I've talked to believe it's one of the fastest growing addictions in our country and that it will soon even surpass alcoholism, which has always been the number one addiction. It just, it's rising so high and it's, you know, alcohol used to, there, there are age limits to it as far as accessibility and it's more anonymous. It's more accessible. It's, it's more affordable. A lot of it's free to get started. And so it's just, it's growing like you're saying are you would you agree with that are you seeing that oh yeah i i I actually think it's far surpassed alcoholism Mm. and the reason you know it's it's such a secretive um shame-based addiction that we go to great lengths to hide it and so knowing what the true numbers are really is impossible yeah Um, but i i think it's gone far beyond uh substance abuse i do could you imagine if how people are responding to COVID right now, if that's how people responded to pornography and the addiction, like, oh my gosh, would we see change and transformation? In what way? What do you mean, babe? Well, I just think like there, the stats for how dangerous pornography is Mm. and how, um, how high it is in every country, you know, it's not, it doesn't just affect the U S it's everywhere just like COVID, but everybody, I just feel like there's a lack of education around pornography and there's been so much education around COVID and, you know, just vaccines. And, and I'm glad that people are being educated yet at the same time, I'm like, okay, but there's also other things that are, have very high stats that we should be very alarmed about and be educated on. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, just diving right into that. You know, I know we're going to come back to your story, but I just feel like we're on a topic right now. of just good stuff. Let's just keep it going. What would you say are the biggest topics of what pornography does to the brain that maybe people are uneducated about? Well, that's, you know, it's a great question. I, I actually started asking that question back. I think it was probably about 1998, 90, 1997. The internet was just barely coming into, you know, coming into being in vogue. And I, and I was, um, I was still very much an addiction then and really questioning, just desperate to come out of that myself. And about that time, I was introduced to an amazing man who had become my mentor, my teacher, uh, Dr. Paige Bailey, who was a world renowned neuropsychologist. Mm, wow. And I, and I asked him, I said, Paige, how does this work? you know, is, are these images harmless? Is it, is it, is it no big deal? Is it just, you know, guys will be guys. It's, it's a natural pastime. 
And he started to educate me about the impact that pornography has on the human brain. Mm. And that opened up an entire world to me that I had no idea about. Wow. And that's where my first book came out. Uh, after three years of research with him, I wrote The Drug of the New Millennium, right? The brain science behind pornography addiction. Mm. And what we learn is that uh, it, really, it really is a chemical addiction. Uh, very, it's a, it, is a, it is a form of substance abuse. And people hear, well, what are you talking about? You don't inject it or ingest it. What do you mean? Well, when we view these images, they're so powerful in the response they cause in the brain that the brain will release the same kinds of internal chemicals that you see with heroin use or cocaine use, right? Mm -hmm. Massive amounts of dopamine and endorphins and testosterone and serotonin and all of these, all of these chemicals that put us into this, this state of a rush or a high very akin to what we experience with other common substances. Mm. And so really, I just say the delivery mechanism is different, but the response in the brain is, is very, very much the same. Wow. Yeah. What does that do for people? Do you think that what read your books that get educated on what happens to the brain? What is the response that you're hoping for as an author and as a therapist? I, we, got to talk off air and there's no question about your heart. You want to see people set free from this addiction, from this behavior that is controlling their life. What is it that, that the outcome is that you're hoping for as they become educated on these topics? Yeah, there's a couple of really primary purposes for me. Um, I would say that the biggest is that I want to help people to get shame off of their shoulders, right? They think that they're just broken, weak, perverted, lost, hopeless, right? They think that they're unique in all the world. I felt that way for a long time. Yeah, me too. And as we start to talk about the neuroscience, what I see people do is say, wow, you mean there's a logical, reasonable explanation about why I got caught up in this and why I can't seem to say no or walk away from it? Yeah. And as they, yeah. as they see how that works, like, oh, wow, okay. It's not just about me. There's all these other elements going on. So Getting that shame out of the way is where you can open the door to real healing. Mm. So that's one primary thing for me. The other one is if you can show people that there's a logical explanation of how they got into this, then they start to open themselves to there being a logical explanation of how to get out. Yeah. And I like, and I say the same kinds of things that got you into this and trapped are the same prints, the same neural brain principles that are going to get you out. I like um, that. I, yeah. I kind of joke. I say, you know what? You're already really good at this. Sure. Because <laughs> you're because you have an addiction. That's mm -hmm. proof that you're super good. You just haven't been shown how to direct and manage it yet. Okay, so we got we got we gotta touch on that because you know the the um I don't know if it's an old adage or or the the success saying that what you know, if you got what got you into this, it's going to take different things to get you out of it. I feel like mm -hmm. you're saying something that's counterintuitive here, and I don't want that to be. I want I want us to elaborate on that so our listeners can really understand what you're saying. What you're saying is you you did certain practices or principles or certain habits that got you here. We just have to retrain those mm -hmm. so that you can see a way out. Can you elaborate on what you're talking about there? Yeah, of course. So you look at all the elements that are present with addiction and especially pornography or sexual addiction, there are some things that are, that are in that formula or mix. One of those is that I have tremendous need. There's something in my life that's uncomfortable, stressful, I'm overwhelmed, I'm depressed, I'm bored, I'm lonely, I'm disconnected. Whatever it is that's triggering me into a place where I have this tremendous need for self-soothing, escape, avoidance, right? Something to help me feel better. And now I discover this instant drug. I push a button and my brain floods with these wonderful, amazing chemicals. And I, I get relief from, you know, whatever is pressing on me in life. And so we have, we have high meaning. We have a very big reward to that process. And the other thing that we engage in with addiction is we have consistent practice and repetition over and over and over again. And whenever you take those elements, high meaning and reward, a very deep emotional need, 
and then I, I put in repetition and practice for, you know, I would, I'd have to say my addiction, what are we talking? Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of repetitions mm -hmm. over in my case, 30 years, that's going to now establish some very deep dominant wiring in the brain. So now it just simply becomes part of who I am. Mm -hmm. I don't even think about it anymore. It's just automatic, just right. Stimulus response, stimulus response. So I've really, addictions just have it on steroids. I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's the most powerful habit formation process imaginable. So what if I can take all those elements I just mentioned, now put them all in place from a healthy, positive uh, standpoint and start practicing those same elements to now become a healthy individual, a connected individual. What got me in can get me out. Yeah, that's so that's good. What I mean when I say that. Yeah. No, that makes so much sense. And I just think there's so much to what you're saying. There's so much depth there because, and Charity, please interrupt me if you have a thought there, but, you know, that was really what sets free the shame in my own experience is understanding there's a reason why I'm doing this versus a guy who, like me who's pounding their fist on the pavement going, why? I'm beating my chest, looking up to the sky having the shame that compounds from my wife who's asking me, why do you do this? I don't have an answer being in, being sitting in a pew or a, a, a chair at church and hearing the pastor read certain parts of the Bible. This is if you're a Christian, you don't have habitual sin. So you're like, Oh, I'm obviously I'm, there's something wrong with me internally. And so I'm internally flawed. It just that shame piece. And then because I've never been taught how to healthily build those habits in my life, you're just talking about toxic shame, just being, it's just taking over my body as a cancer and there's no hope, right? So when someone like yourself comes along and sits down with another man or they hear it on a podcast, like, Hey, listen, there's a reason why you do it. You may not know that reason, but there is an underlying root reason. And most of it is based in shame or in habits in needs that we never learned how to fulfill in healthy ways is what I hear you saying. Yeah. And, and the thing is those needs are legitimate. It isn't that we're that we're flawed or just broken or weak because we have needs. Everyone has these kinds of needs. Yeah. I have a need to feel peace. I have a need to to feel uh, affirmed and 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 wanted and valuable that I matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I have a need to feel secure. There are all these different things, and when those are when those are violated, when we feel unsafe, when we feel out of control the brain is going to go searching for an answer. It's going to go looking for a solution. Um, Dr. Bailey, he was the first one to really, he showed, I, he showed me what was going on in my head, mm. right? I was like, that, like, Dr. Bailey, show me what happens to me when I get into that place where I can't say no. It seems like I go from, you know, Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Yep. And we, we know about that split personality of addiction. And what he did, he showed me uh, the, the little diagram he showed me changed my life forever. Mm. And, and if those listening picture uh, an hourglass shape, right? So it's wide at the top. It goes very much down to this narrow little tunnel and then goes wide again at the bottom. That's how the brain behaves in addiction, especially with pornography or sex. Mm. So let me show you how this works. So let's say that something in my life is causing me stress, could be any number of what we call triggers. Um, I have a thing called blasted, bored or burned out, lonely, angry, anxious, or afraid, stressed or tired. Yeah, it's so good. that kind of covered cover the gamut right there. Yeah, 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 it does. It's <laughs> good. So I'm, I'm feeling one or more of those. And so my brain says, oh my gosh, how do I, what's the solution to this? What's the answer? And so when I have those triggers, the brain will now start heading toward this hourglass. And it, the brain knows because it's experienced it previously. And this is, this is where pornography addiction becomes really insidious. It isn't usually because we went seeking it or we knew what it was. It's typically when we're very young and we're exposed to it through you know, myriad ways in our sexualized culture. And we experience that, that incredible chemical rush in our brains when we're exposed to it. And probably along the way, we also experience masturbation. 
uh, I have clients that really um, in one way or another were exposed to that even as young as five or six years of age, which is just crazy to, to think of, right? But once your brain discovers that incredible reward, that massive chemical flood that gives you temporary relief from the stress of life, the brain remembers. Oh, I remember that incredible reward system. Mm. So when we feel those triggers, the brain says, okay, let's go back into that funnel. And at the top of the funnel, when we, when we go in, it starts to narrow. And as we go down that, the sides of that funnel, all of those chemicals release. Dopamine, endorphins, testosterone, right? So it's all of these, and we feel better. Yeah. You actually, it's not fake. I'm actually feeling better, wow. And then we get into that really narrow place and that's where we've shut everything else out. And this is what's confusing to a lot of people they, they, I work with, they'll say, Mark, when I get into that addiction mindset, why do I forget my wife, my family, God, my kids, my future? It's like, I just throw it all under the bus. How does that happen? And the, and the response is that is, a, that is a chemical response in the brain. Wow. People, will, and what happens when we engage in those behaviors? People will ask us, well, what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. And the typical response is I wasn't, but yeah. I, I'm gonna suggest it's worse than that. I couldn't. Mm. Once I go in that funnel and those chemicals release, my brain narrows its focus and shuts out all distractions that are not related to me getting to that reward. Yep. My brain wants one thing, yep. get me to that reward, which, which we know in this addiction is climax, you know, that crescendo. So it, closes, it, it can't think about anything else. It's all shut off. And so now I get to that narrow place, I get the reward, but then after, the, after climax, I emerge from that narrow place yeah. back into the wide part of the funnel and all of those chemicals dissipate. My, my prefrontal cortex logic, reasoning and consequences comes back online and the full realization of what, I do, what I've done hits me mm. like a train. Wow. And I call it the, I call it the, the self-dialogue from hell. Mm. What was I doing? What was I thinking? How, have I could, how could I have given up everything that matters to me? Yep. And that's where the shame floods, floods us you know, like a tidal wave. And here's, here's, the, here's the really terrible part. Because I feel so bad in the bottom of that funnel, what do you think I'm now motivated to do? Go back up. Yeah, go back. You go up. right back in the top to, mm. to self-soothe and escape all over again. Yep. And there's the cycle. Yep. Uh, but once you understand that funnel, you're like, oh, now I get yeah. it. Why? Yep. I don't care about anything or anyone. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Real quick, real quick. Cause I love this. I love this recording. It's great, but it's not enough to see the diagram to understand it. Are, is this in any of your books? Is this in anything besides just the one-on-one -on -one coaching with you just to throw a little. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually in both of my books. So the drug of the new millennium has extensive uh, chapters on this, but also the pornography paradox talks great. about it as well. Okay, y'all heard that. Go buy the book. Y'all heard that just so, now. <laughs> so if people were so if people were gonna buy a book, yeah. The pornography yeah. paradox is pretty good, but the uh, or I'm I'm sorry, the drug of the new millennium is pretty good, but it's kind of a little outdated. Okay. If you're looking for something to really help, the pornography paradox is the one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we want them to go buy that. So go yeah, buy just, it right now. Just hit the pause <laughs> button on this on this podcast <laughs> and go buy yeah, it. Just, just go to right. Amazon. You know, yeah. and, and what's so, and this is a, this is an incredible conversation, Mark, because, and I know I'm not letting you share it all, Charity. I'm sorry. I'm just taking over this podcast here. I really <laughs> apologize because I'm getting excited. You know, you can't blame me. I'm like, oh my God. You're passionate yeah. and motivated. <laughs> Keep going. I like it. You know, I think for so long, we're so frustrated why a picture of my wife and her wedding dress on my screen isn't enough. We're, we're frustrated that we got a picture of our kids as the backdrop on our computer. Mm. And we're and there are daughters and our sons. And, you know, we're so angry that that we're looking at pornography in the middle of a church service. I mean, I was literally the guy that was in church. It was like leaving the service, going to the bathroom, looking at pornography on my phone in the bathroom of the church, maybe even masturbating and then going back in the service going, what is wrong with me? Why is it not enough? You know, calling somebody and then still doing it afterward. And what's 
And what you're saying is, listen, it's, it's not, it's not that you are internally flawed. It's not that your family isn't enough. You're, you're, you're looking at it through the wrong lens. What you need to look at it through is this chemical dependence, the chemical reaction. And what we, what we believe is that your brain will always go towards the experiential part. Your brain will go towards the part and the way that you've handled that undesired or that legitimate need is you've gone to this addiction. And so it's not enough to put up blocks. I'm not saying these things are bad, but it's not enough. We can't just behavior modification. We can't just behavioral manage it. We have to learn healthy ways of understanding our needs, communicating those and meeting them in a healthy way. Otherwise we're always going to have some form of negative coping mechanism to meet these needs. Always, you know, and, and, a way to think about this to, to help people understand it is if I have a problem with alcohol, right? Someone, if I said to you, look, your alcoholism is not about the liquid in the glass. It's about all the underlying issues that drive you to go seek that liquid in order to, in order to self-soothe or, or escape or cope. Pornography is not about sex. Mm. And when people hear me say, they're like, what? Yeah. No, it, it isn't about that any more than the alcohol is about, is about the liquid. It's about what's under it. What drives my need to go to this place as my coping mechanism? Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest things that I help people do is let's start to understand what is it that starts you down the path walking towards that funnel. And the better you can become at noticing those things early, the more successful that you'll be in beginning to break out of this and literally rewire your brain. Yeah. You know, I'll tell people, I can't help you recover with the brain that you have today sitting in front of me. Mm. I've got to help you build a new brain. Mm. And the way we do that is precisely the way that you built your addiction wiring in the first place. Yeah. We need powerful meaning. We need you to start to be aware of emotions and triggers that drive you to that place of feeling out of control or needing to cope. And then we need to have you practice consistently on a repetitive basis, healthy outlets, healthy coping strategies. Uh, there's what I call a healthy funnel. The funnel experience is not good or bad, you know, or good or evil, it just is. I can put anything into that funnel that I want if we put pornography into the funnel, the result's going to be destructive. If I put substances in, it's gonna be the same thing. I'll tell you one of the things I've learned myself is one of my uh, healthy coping strategies over the years. This will probably give people uh, maybe a glimpse into how this works. So if I'm out in public and, I, and I'm a man, I notice attractive people, both men and women. And if I see, for example, a, a woman who's especially attractive and catches my eye, I don't look away, look up, look down, close my eyes, right? The avoidance strategy. I'll notice her. I'll acknowledge to myself that she's really attractive. But immediately what I do is I say, wow, she reminds me of my wife. Now, it doesn't matter. She could look completely different from my wife in every, in every, in every way. That's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. The fact that I was feeling attracted and that feeling and emotion was coming mm -hmm. over me I've trained, retrained my brain to immediately have that feeling of attraction turn me to thoughts of my wife. Mm. Oh, wow, I'm feeling attracted. Oh, my wife. Mm. And it's funny because people, if you, if you were to see me in public and a really attractive woman walks by and I get a good, big grin on my face, you could misinterpret what oh, I'm God. actually thinking. Absolutely. What I'm thinking about is my wife. Oh, my wife. Gosh, she's so amazing. I love her. I can't wait to... I might even pick up my phone and call her right then. Hey, I was just thinking about you. Wow. A really attractive woman walked by and I thought of you. <laughs> but we have that kind of relationship today where I can be that authentic. But look how that I took meaning. Yeah. Right. Natural God given attraction. And I said, okay, I'm feeling this. Where, where do I apply it? How do I channel it? Yeah, that reminds that I have all those feelings from my wife. Yeah. Wow, I just started thinking about her. Now I'm going into a funnel that is all about my wife, my fond feelings, our history together, how much I appreciate her. 
I might even see an attractive woman and then a few minutes later I'm, I'm sort of tearing up. Mm -hmm. It's because I'm in, I'm in the funnel with my wife mm -hmm. and that triggered all of that huh. memory and system and wiring in my head. And that's been thousands of repetitions for me over years and years. And so I have a different brain that when I see somebody, might even be somebody, somebody scantily clad or somebody in a bikini or whatever, it doesn't matter. Wow, she reminds me of my wife. Wow. So you see how that works? Yeah. It's the same thing that got me into that addiction. Now I've used mm -hmm. to completely rewire me so that it's a different response. Same stimulus, mm -hmm. different response. And what I hear you saying, Mark, is it's not that you're going out and you're seeking those images. You're not at all. No. It's, it's just saying that, hey, we live in a culture that is over-sexualized. We live in a culture where us as guys, if we are trying to never see a woman who is trying to appear attractive or a billboard or something, then we should probably just live in our Good living <laughs> in our bedroom closet and never leave. I mean, we should never watch any TV show because it has commercials. So even if the show's good, commercials are bad. Or yeah. We should never go outside of our house, you know, because who knows what our neighbor's going to be wearing that day. I mean, like, you know what I mean? It's just like, so what you're saying is, listen, okay, we can't have this idea that we can avoid all of it but we can create a new way to interpret it. Now, I know our listeners may have a hard time with that. I know, I know I get some pushback for you saying that, but I think it's so healthy because yeah. the reality for you is that, hey, listen, when I see it, what am I going to do? Because it doesn't work. We can pretend to look away, but we're still thinking about it. We're still, we're still, now if we're like, okay, we're trying to avoid it, you know, it's like trying to say, okay, say the word elephant and not think about an elephant. It's like, that doesn't work. You know what I mean? So you're trying well, to funnel it in a healthy way. And I just think that's amazing. Yeah, neurologically, you know, you can't, you can't not see it because the brain will capture that entire stimulus in a third of a second mm. yeah. and it's permanently stored. It's done before you even recognize you've seen it, it's in. Yeah. Mm. And so believe me, I teach all kinds of techniques and tools, you know, to not go seeking stuff, to not be foolish and walking the razor's edge, seeing how close you can get. Yeah, we talk about all that, but but we live in this sexualized culture. Yeah. And to me, it's a shame if I feel like I'm a slave or, mm -hmm. or a prisoner in my own world, right? Yeah. And I tried yeah. that. At one point in my addiction, I said, okay, I'm going to close myself off from everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't go to the beach. I didn't go to the, the public pool with my kids. I didn't, you know, I didn't watch TV, couldn't go to movies. Could I mean, think of all the things you say, okay. Yeah. Those are no longer doable. I, in essence, I became a hermit. Yeah. And guess what? My addiction didn't go away. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, what would happen, we call that white knuckling or mm -hmm. you know, sheer willpower. I found that some of my biggest relapses came on the end of those really strict, wow. perfectionistic, you know, just mm -hmm. bury your face and grit your teeth. My biggest re relapses came after those experiences because I wasn't doing anything to change the way I think. I wasn't rewiring that brain. I was just saying, shut off the source and I'll be fine. Mm. But that doesn't change you. Yeah, I don't know. Um, how long, because these are called, if I am correct, they're called neuropathways, right? Mm -hmm. And because there's neuroplasticity in our brain, meaning that we can um, form our brain, we can create these new neural pathways. How long does it take? Because if, if you're saying, you know, however long the addiction was, like one neural pathway is so deep, it's so strong, it just mm. happens like that, right? How long does it take to create and create a new neural pathway? That's a really good question. You know, that was that was one of the first questions I had for my mentor. It's like, OK, I believe you that this can happen. So how long is it going to take? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is it depends. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, here's a really hopeful thing. Actually, the first time that I dare to have the courage or the strength to choose differently than I have in the past, that very first different choice immediately begins to rewire my brain. So it takes one time, mm. yep. one time to start the process. Mm. Now, I do need to engage in repetition. I do need to try to be consistent. 
because every time I leave that new path and go back to the old one, guess what I do? I keep reinforcing that old one. Mm. But we start to change from the very first choice, the very first healthy choice. Now there's a few, th- now someone says, okay, I've been addicted for 30 years. Is it gonna take 30 years to rewire me? Mm. <laughs> that's not very hopeful, right? No. But that's not how it works. There are, there, so there are things that we can do to enhance or to accelerate the rewiring process. Mm. So one of those, of course, is consistent repetition, but a big, big one that I, I talk a lot about is what I call meaning. To the brain, meaning is everything. Mm. What something means to me, what is my intention? That has a powerful impact on how much, atten- how, how much priority the brain will give to it. So if I can start to introduce deep meaning into my recovery, like, I, like the, what I told you about my, how I use my fond, uh, uh, my fond feelings and love for my wife, that's an accelerator of rewiring of the brain. Mm. Because look at all the memories I already have in place about her. Yep. That already exists in here. So I'm not having to add all that brand new. I'm just going in and accessing powerful memories and feelings and emotions and bringing them into the process of recovery. I'm taking that addiction wiring and I'm introducing what pornographers never want you to introduce. You'll notice in pornography, there's no talk of marriage, family, kids, right? Yep. You don't have, none of that's ever addressed because they know if they let any of that in, there's a chance I'll access those memory banks while I'm involved with the images. Mm. And that can just blow the whole thing apart. I'm gonna purposely bring in those images now and access them as powerful meaning as I try to make healthy choices with this. Yeah. You speed, so that's, that's already wiring this in there. You're just, you're just bringing it into the mix. You're accessing it. So I don't have to start from scratch and do 30 years worth. Mm. I've already got all those years or decades that are already in place. I'm just not tapping them. Mm. Yeah. So good. So good. I'm over here just thinking hard. My brain's working. I feel like my neural pathways are changing. It might be the Autobahn upstairs right now. You know, that's what, that's what I got going on. You know what? It's almost like an image I got where we are so used to getting, it's like, it's like two freeways that run parallel to each other. And one of those is a freeway of addiction. And one of those is a healthy way. And what we don't have is we don't have an on-ramp onto the healthy meaning side. And so what you're saying is it's there. You already have this freeway of, of healthy thinking and meaning. And so you're just building this on-ramp onto here. Good, good, good analogy. It's exactly what you're doing. Because there's a hopelessness in recovery, right? Oh my gosh, I got I to gotta start from scratch. I got to do all this stuff that's hard and new, right? Nothing I've done in the past, you know, can help me. And that's not true. You have all these resources that are there. The other great accelerator that is often missed, I like to say grace is one of the greatest accelerators for the rewiring of the brain that you'll ever find. Mm. There is a power outside of us that is that you and I can call upon in this moment. I I, I call it you know the the the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, yep. right? I believe is a power that's in that's right here around me in the universe that I can access right now in this instance, and I can call upon that to add to me what I don't have, and that 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 grace that power can actually accelerate brain rewiring. Mm. Isn't that awesome? It's amazing. Yes. Right? It's, it's, not all, it's not all up to me. It's not all on my shoulders. I, I tell guys, look, you got to move from me to we. Mm. Recovery is about us. You are no longer alone. Stop trying to go it alone. Mm. For so many years, I said, well, if I can be sober long enough and do all of these right things, then Jesus will invite me back into his circle and he'll help me. I always thought I had to go through this proving process yeah. and I was so, so uh, off the track. Mm. It's like, no, even to start to make this attempt, you need to call upon him. Yeah. Lord, I want to start to make the try. And he's like, I'm right here. Mm. Let me infuse you with my power so that you can do this more easily and more quickly. 
than you could by yourself. Love that, Mark. I'm going to, okay, I want to take this back because I had a question that I just remembered. I'm so glad I remembered it. Okay, so I'm just, all I have is my personal experience, the guys that I've had the privilege of walking with in this. And it's pretty common to have that brain hijacking moment, right? What happens is whatever the need is, we are so unaware of it that we just are not aware of it. And so it's compounding. It's compound. It's almost like when you just, I don't, I don't even understand an analogy for it. So I'm not going to go there, but right. You just compound so much that there's this need that's there that hasn't been met in healthy ways. And pretty soon now we're reacting to the lack of, uh, of fulfillment and it's coming out. And so for, for, and even as for me, what's happened in recovery and, and what we call restoration has been that, okay, I've no longer, I've learned how to not go to pornography anymore. But just because I'm no longer going in that area, it doesn't mean that I found healthy ways to know what I need in that moment, understand it, and then not feel like a wimp trying to vocalize it. I mean, let's get real. As men, you know, in my life at least, I haven't had men around me talking about their needs all the time. They're like these, you know, just that wasn't taught. It's unfortunate. Now what I know is that macho men are aware of their needs and they talk about it because that makes them more macho than not talking about it. But when, when my example is people that don't do it, it is so hard for me to come to my wife or other men and say, Hey man, I need this today. You know? And so can we, can you just talk about how do we get there and how do we start that journey? It's so true. I mean, the thing is we don't grow up having modeled to us by other men in our lives how to do this. They mm -hmm. teach us just the opposite, right? A lot of my, well, my wife used to refer to me as stoic, mm. right? You were so stoic. So we don't express, we don't admit that, you know, that we're vulnerable or fragile or any of those things because it isn't, ma you know, quote, macho. You said something really important. Um, sobriety does not mean recovery. Yeah. I can be sober even for long periods of time, but not be in, in healthy recovery. So healthy recovery means that I realize that my pornography is a symptom, it's on the surface, and do I wanna dig down below the layers to see what's driving that at the core? And this is where we start to get into men's favorite words like vulnerability, <laughs> authenticity, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, wait a second. Here. <laughs> so true. And so what we don't realize when we're, when we're in addiction is that <clears throat> we have all these emotions and feelings happening, even if we're unaware of them, they're inside, um, you know, creating this, this energy of need. Uh, it was so funny. I remember when I started to, when my, my mentors and, and others who I, who got me on the recovery track said, Mark, what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And I looked at them like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. What am I feeling? Like mad, sad, glad, isn't that it? <laughs> right? It's like three. And it took me a long time to even realize that I had mm -hmm. emotions. But once you start to learn that, that there's stuff under here driving this, now you can start to use some simple tools mm -hmm. to get into true recovery. I like to call it healthy living. In other words, what a healthy person would do, regardless of whether they are recovering from an addiction or not. So I'll give you, I'll give you a few. Um, one of those is, is a daily emotional check-in with your wife, if you're married, where you and your wife come together, you just get raw and honest and authentic with each other. What am I feeling today? What am I feeling emotionally, physically, spiritually? What's, what's my day been like, good or bad? I'm just going to be totally transparent with you. That is hard when you haven't had it modeled and you haven't practiced it. Yeah, um, it's excruciating for my for my guys when I first tried to teach. Like, well, oh, Mark, I can't. I don't. I don't know what to say. I can't do that. Oh yeah. And so we work hard at this this concept of transparency. So doing check ins with people, um, having a, a sponsor or a reach out partner or an accountability partner, someone that you can get on the phone and say, Hey, man today really, really stunk. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, I mean, I'm angry. I'm, I just want to just like punch somebody out. And I just needed to get real about that. Yeah. See, now we're, now we're addressing the underlying issues without letting them build up. Yeah. I, I say, 
your emotions are going to find a way to be expressed. Mm. Whether you, you can choose how that happens or they can choose it for you. But make no mistake, it is going to happen. Yeah. And, we, and we see people that shut stuff down and finally the emotions will be expressed. Guess how? Heart disease, cancer, mm -hmm. all kinds of health issues. Finally, the body says, I'm done. You, you will never let this be expressed or get out. Mm. So I'm, it's crisis now. So that's, that's a big one that, that is so important. Mm. The mm. other one is self-care. Do we have good daily self-care? Are we, are we having renewal and recharging and um, recreation? I call it re-creation. Re Am I taking care of myself physically, emotionally, and spiritually? And that doesn't mean hours and hours in the morning. Oh, I have to have a three-hour self-care routine every morning. I got to give it 4 a.m. I am a big believer in integrating into your life things that you're already doing. Just integrate self-care into those activities. Drive time. You know, I, you'll find me when I'm driving in my car. God and I are conversing, man. That is primo spiritual time. We're, we're having a conversation. Going for a walk, I got my earbuds in, listening to some really, really awesome Christian music. Yeah. Um, so many ways that you can fit self-care into your daily routine so it doesn't require all this extra. I don't want to pile more on my plate because that's my problem. Totally. But I, but I can integrate a mindfulness in taking care of my spiritual, emotional, physical needs into my already existing life. Hey, Mark, obviously we need two parts. So we are going to wrap up right now <laughs> and then we are going to have you on again to finish this out. Thank you, Mark, for being here for part one. It has been amazing. Yeah, my pleasure.